Hey friends and foes, welcome to Brushwork Podcast. My name is Stephanie Scott and today I have Dave Clay here chatting with me in the studio. Dave is a oil painter, does industrial landscapes and beautiful, beautiful portraits and figures. And I'm so excited to have you on today. I have bought one of your paintings in the past for my partner and I was just thinking, who do I want to have on the podcast today? Someone whose art I own, which is very fun. <laughs> Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. For people who don't know your work, can you describe what you make? Sure. I'm primarily a figure painter, you know, the human figure, nudes primarily. I also do industrial landscapes, so paintings of uh, the insides of steel mills and foundries where they're uh, melting down scrap metal and turning it into, you know, steel products and things like that, machinery. It's very punk. Uh, yeah, I, I love doing them. <laughs> they're very atmospheric and moody. And I tend to use a lot of brushwork and noise and textures in my paintings I try to stay away from you know refining paintings too far so that they're photorealist I tend to stay kind of painterly and, and you know to a certain extent abstract I I love using abstraction in figurative work and I think it's very evocative I myself am an abstract oil painter and mm -hmm. I love I, I don't know there's something about there's this category called disruptive realism, and I feel like you almost are on the edges of that, and your work is very, like, the, the figure emerges from the abstracted background, and it's it's very tasteful, and it's very interesting. <laughs> Can you tell me about your the origins of your artistic career? I've been just drawing and making art for as long as I can remember. Uh, my parents said that I was drawing when I was a wee kid, and uh, I've always remembered drawing as something that I've done. Um, in grade school, I remember drawing boats and sports cars and things, tanks. and That's fine. You know, just, yeah, just, I love drawing machinery and mechanics. I thought I wanted to be a mechanical engineer for a long time back when I was in high school. Um, but I then got into comic books, and that really sort of started that figure drawing life of mine that I you know, carried on. Uh, so I wanted to be a comic book artist for a while, and then I went to college and was taking drawing and painting there. Mm -hmm. And I, it turned out, I realized it was a good sort of self-realization that I didn't really want to tell a story uh, in frames and panels and direct a sort of movie in my right. art. I actually just focus on the figure. I like drawing the I like drawing the comic book covers more than the actual comic books themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it dawned on me, I was like, oh, maybe I actually just want to be an artist and not a comic book artist. <laughs> They're very, very different. Making comics is a whole different field of expertise. And was there like a catalyst moment where you were like, mm, better stop doing this, better pick up my paintbrush instead? I don't I don't recall any specific moment that was a realization. I think it was I had tried to do a few comic books just on my own mm -hmm. uh, and would just spend inordinate amounts of time drawing the individual pictures and then struggling to... I think the thing, the, at least the concept that was surprising to me that I had learned was you're a director as a comic book artist. You have to tell, yeah. indicate the story and the events of what's going on, where you position the figures and how they gesture to each other and things. And that was really hard. It was like, oh, that that's a whole other skill set that I haven't thought about and haven't practiced. Um, and I really like just interesting poses of the figures and, you know, working on the expression and that, that, that over time I realized that that's all I was doing mm -hmm. I wasn't actually drawing comic books I was just drawing uh, and I think it's somewhere on the round that I just kind of gave up on the idea I was like well I'm having fun doing this I'm just going to keep doing this and not pursue the comic book path I love it so you went from comics right into figurative painting no actually there was a lot many years between the painting and the drawing um in college, I was doing a lot of just, you know, pencil, pen and ink, mm -hmm. comic book type styles and learning new, you know, charcoal, you know, the traditional mediums as art school does. As you do. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then for a while, I was doing this digital collage because this was back in 1996, 97. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really interested in computer art and using digital mediums. And so I would take a bunch of found imagery and layered upon found photos of people and uh these are massive big files they really kind of I'm sure they were. 200 300 layer files of <laughs> photoshop files um but they were they were interesting to me because they were sort of exploring this noise and texture of the world impo superimposed on figures um and that was a lot of fun to do i did a bunch of album covers through that and 
um, prints and started showing those and selling those. I did that until about 2008, from like 2002 to 2008. And I was, I was drawing, but not as a main medium. Right. Self. And then it, I sort of stopped doing that because I really wanted to get back into drawing more. And like I was in a band for years and I was kind of focused on doing that band stuff that whole time. And so I stopped the band thing and started doing art. And that's when I started doing acrylic a bit, ink kind of wash, kind of some interesting mechanical construction with line work. I did that till about 2015. And then I started oil painting and I decided that was where I wanted to go and practice form and you know, to a certain extent, that more more ability to create textures with paint rather than with, you know, using a pen. It's a very fine line. And so you're drawing your own wires and, you know, textures and things. Yeah. So take a piece of paint and scrape it with a razor and suddenly you've got all these textures come out of it. <laughs> That's pretty fun. I like hearing about the natural evolution of a person's creativity. I started uh, doing equestrian art and now I do only triangles I'm like show me a shape and I love it it's great and <laughs> the journey it takes a long time and hearing about a, a comic artist turning into a figurative oil painter it's it's uh, a huge distinction I've seen a couple of your figurative paintings lately and I've seen some more mixed media elements put in at your <laughs> latest gra- show at figure ground gallery I was like oh this is interesting this is different than what I've seen from you before can you tell me about the mixed media work? Yeah, absolutely. That actually came from that middle period after 2008 when I started doing some more acrylic ink wash stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was still into, you know, I guess I'm still into um, sort of that anime cyberpunk dystopian future. It's super fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lovely aesthetic. I just I just have so much fun with it. I always have Blade Runner kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so when I was drawing those, they were, you know, sort of cyborgy kind of. I, I, I didn't want to be illustrative of these figures being specifically cyborgs. I was actually thinking more about, you know, the, how we see ourselves as humanity progressing into an internet age, um, an electronic age, a digital age, and superimposing those concepts visually, which is probably a highbrow way of saying I just like drawing cyborgs, but it sounds, I guess. <laughs> It sounds very professional. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, things you learn over the years of mm-hmm. art. <laughs> but at the time, I was thinking, oh, it'd be cool if I actually put wires and components and electrical things, circuit board patterns and microchips and things on these drawings. And so I started doing that. And I got a lot, a lot of people really thought that was a cool thing. Um, the, the director for the Erotic Art Fest, Gralio Arado, just adores them, owns a couple of pieces. Uh, and it was fun to do, and I kind of felt like I hit a peak with that sort of style of multimedia in pen and ink. I was like, oh, I really like these, but I'm, I feel like I'm not going anywhere, and I'm not sure where to go next. Yeah. And that's when I took up the oil painting to say, well, what if I did more textural form instead mm-hmm. of line work? And recently, I've, it's always been in the plan, and recently I've been a, a sort of like, okay, I think I know how to do it, um, to add back in the kind of components to the paintings instead of just adding components to the line work. And that's a challenge because one of the things I learned doing the component multimedia thing with the line drawings is that if you put the components on the figure as if they were part of the figure, Mm -hmm. it was failing. It was, it looked kind of kitsch. Mm -hmm. Um, It components were so drastically physically different from the drawing that they would compete with each other visually. And the, they wouldn't work. And the, but if I moved the components to just in an abstract space or in an abstract pattern around the figure, near the figure, and had the figure interact with that abstract placement of the components, that worked much better. Suddenly, the components aren't competing with the anatomy of the figure, right? Or the figure. Now it's in conversation. So, exactly. Exactly. And so that now that I've you know gone to painting and starting to do this, that's that same sort of how do the components interact with the space of the painting and the figure? Um, they're a different feel and texture, it's sculptural versus flat. It's sort of sorting out that problem has been a challenge, but it's finally now starting to make sense to me in the realm of painting. Uh, so I'm excited to get back into it. I've got a whole three or four paintings ready to 
get the power tools out and <laughs> go into them. I cannot wait to see these. <laughs> They're going to be really <laughs> cool. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it is. It is very easy to be kitschy, like you said, with mixed media and with the form. It's so a form is so narrative in itself, just in a gesture. And I find a lot of times when you see work that has a mixed media element or, or a gold or a glitter or something like that, it's you you have to be so masterful and so careful and so like considerate about what's happening that it takes a lot of practice. And I'm sure you have lots of fails in your studio lying around being like, that, that didn't work because I know I have in my past. <laughs> and it's yep. it's kind of fun to experiment though. It is. It's, it's definitely one of the, one of the things that really I adore about this work and being in the studio is that exploration, especially when you, you're just like free of you know, expectations and failure. If you right. can just get yourself in that creative flow and start hacking things together, it's just so satisfying. Who were your favorite teachers that you had when you were <laughs> learning your all these new uh, kinds of trades in the art field? I had my college professor was Pamela Shermer back at UW Milwaukee. And I remember the, the funny story about her was that I was doing comic books and she hated comic books. <laughs> she would just get on me about drawing this. I always thought she really hated me until one day she took me aside and some one-on-one -on -one meeting was like, I really like your your drawings and you're really good at this. I was like, oh, I thought you didn't like this. Like, well, I, just, I was like, I think you could do more with this than just comic books. At the time I was kind of angry because I'm like, well, comic books are a legitimate form of art, blah, blah, blah. Of, of course. I was just a bad student at 18. So. <laughs> um, but, you know, she taught me the basics of, you know, drawing. And that was, you know, looking back at it, I was like, I see why. <laughs> and it makes sense. Um, but after that, I dropped out of school and worked on my own. And I didn't really have any structured class or study. Um, and then moving to Seattle in 2012, I started doing figure drawing sessions again. One of the teachers there was Jamie Bolenbach here in Seattle, and he definitely was, he, they were drop-in sessions, just like you would normally go to draw figures, but he would run them like a class. Nice. Uh, over the years, because I did that session every couple of weeks regularly until the pandemic, um, he was just giving me one-on-one -on -one instruction. We had, you know, we got to that point where we were just having one-on-one -on -one sort of just art debates and critiques That's with each so other. Nice. That's so nice. He's kind of my studio, I go to his studio and we talk about it. So he really had a big influence on how I think about art and why I paint the way I do and the things I should think about. And, but other than that, those are the two people that sort of were my instructors and everything else has been reading and watching videos and learning and <laughs> reading and lots practice, of books. Practice, right? A ton of practice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I feel like every artist has a formative teacher who can see what your potential is way before you can. And you're like, but I want to do this thing that I've been practicing. And they're like, you should do this other thing that you're actually good at. <laughs> and like your ego can't take the hit. And then years later, you're like, ah, they were right. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely learned much more about ego. <laughs> I do at 18. <laughs> You have two very different kinds of artwork that you make. I, I know you have a similar hand in both of them. And by hand, I mean you're, the way you would do a paintbrush stroke and things like that. But do you have any differences in how you approach your landscapes versus your figures? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, I get I get to some of those kind of questions quite a bit because people see the figures and then they see the landscapes and they seem like utterly different <laughs> subjects. I think about like the... The approach to them, the actual technical approach is definitely different. I mean, it all starts with just really spending a lot of time looking. Mm -hmm. And this is really Jamie Bolenbach coming through. <laughs> um, his emphasis was just look. It, if you're going to draw something from life, you have to study this thing. And that's like at least 50% of the work is looking. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at the industrial landscapes for the reference photos and the real places and sort of just understanding the machinery, what the kind of general structure of them look like, how they work together, what are some of the interesting shapes that I see in them. Once I kind of get that down for the industrial landscapes, it, it's sort of the same thing with figures, you know, just studying where's the hair, where's the eyes, what's the shape of the face. Right. Uh, pose and you know i start then with the industrial landscapes it's more uh perspective drawing than the figures have really no you know, perspective in it but it's not like a structured rigid mm -hmm. uh, point or two point perspective um 
And sometimes I'll start, I used to do this more often, I'll some start with that actual perspective lines. I'll draw a two point perspective or one point perspective, draw some lines, uh, a grid them out so that I know where the lines are. Um, and that I definitely don't do that for the figure drawings. The industrial landscapes, I'll, I'll add some measurement. And it just adds to that ability to portray a space in the industrial landscapes that's much deeper than the figure space where that's a much shallower space. I saw your landscapes first before I was introduced to your figures. And I remember when I saw one of your figure paintings for the first time, I was like, is that Dave? I feel like <laughs> like I, I could recognize the, the color tone and I could recognize a sense of placement that maybe it draws back from your comic book days, but you have very good composition. They feel, your figures don't feel like they're floating in space. They feel like they are in a weighted area, even though it's quite abstracted. It's quite like they like almost cover the figure in some places and like eat at the figure, which is very cool. But you you do have a very strong sense of composition here, which is awesome because it takes a long time to learn that. And I don't know. Do you think one has helped the other? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. The, the, they definitely play with each other probably more in my head maybe than the actual painting but they definitely I think about these things a lot and a lot of times I'll work on an industrial landscape at the same time as I'm working on a figure mm. and going back and forth helps me keep a fresh eye on both because they're different subjects uh, but composition is actually you know that I think I didn't really learn composition until oh like three or four years ago I feel like but certainly Composition is something that came up more in the oil paintings. Before that, I was—I didn't feel like I was doing composition very well, <laughs> looking back on it. Yeah. Um, and now I'm understanding more about where the figure sits in the space. And uh, the, the the industrial landscapes are almost entirely about composition because the, especially more recently, they're imagined spaces more than they're a photograph or me painting a photograph. Mm -hmm. Um, there's actually a, a guy, Victor Macha, who takes photographs in Europe. I think he's from the Czech Republic. His Instagram is full of these photos of documenting, you know, the old uh, European steel mills and across the world. Uh, they're just cool. beautiful photos. And I've copied those several times. Oh, um, nice. He actually owns one, which is awesome. And then the, the imagined spaces now, I'm sort of taking those as reference photos for ideas. And now I'm making these imagined structures and machinery. They're based on reality, but allows me to sort of focus on exactly the composition I want. Because of the composition of these alien machineries is really the creating the immensity and the alien atmosphere that a steel mill has. These machines are just bigger than life and they're... Mm -hmm. They have a life of their own, the glow of the hot metal and steel against the cool, you know, metalwork and tubing behind them. It's really about navigating the space and seeing the interactions and complexities of, a, of an alien space like that. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of composition work goes into that. And that's how a lot that's different than the figures where I'm thinking you know, about the figure form and, and the, how the like you said, how the space interacts with the figure and eats in and they blur together and. Your industrial forges have such a glow to them that is really intense. It, it surprised me when I first saw them. I, I, well, one, I had never seen an industrial landscape quite like that before, except in a video game. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, this is something totally unique. Um, and then, two, your your color control is, is so intense. And it, it probably took you a while to get that kind of glow out of a forge before you were like, yeah, that's that's the look I'm going for. Can you tell me a little bit about how you approach color and your palette? Yeah, I feel I feel somewhat like I, I got lucky in terms of the specifically how do you get the glow mm -hmm. of the molten steel against the, the sort of cool background. That one was something that Jamie Bullenbach had told me a while a while ago about figure drawing and just painting in general before I was really thinking about the industrial landscapes. And he said to get a like a, a bright fire color, a sun color. Um, you think bright, you think white. And he's like, that's the mistake. Mm. You think when you write, you have to think saturation and contrast with the rest of the painting. So this is the old like Joseph Albers color theory stuff. It's a classic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you have read it, it's sort of like structured reading. Um, but so I had this leg up and I knew that 
it, it, it was luckily lodged in my brain somewhere that when I was going to do the molten steel that I couldn't just do white. I had to do like a bright color. And so knowing that and knowing like you know, the reds and yellows were the, the good um, opposite color from the cool blues that I used for the background, I kind of knew that it would work. I, I was surprised at how well it worked, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty sure it was going to work well. And then, yeah, like, you know, the the, mach- the machinery in the industrial landscapes is that, you know, Prussian blue or ultramarine blue um, mixed with burnt sienna to dull it down. So you get this really subtle shade of blues, grays. It's, it's more neutral, cool colors. And I try to not make them too saturated. Uh, they have to be sort of a desaturated, cool color. And that way, when I drop the molten steel, which is naphthol red and cadmium yellow and burnt sienna that cad yellow i don't mix it just you put it in there solid that color and suddenly that against the muted blue burnt sienna grays just pops um and it works really well the trick there is that you have to do the whole at least i do the whole industrial landscape structure and space in those blues first because as soon as you drop that cad yellow in there for the flames that's all you see and it just becomes the immediate focal point of the painting it's really hard to go back in and change anything about the grays the general color theory for me is along along those lines even in the figures uh is cool tones subtle tones not being overly saturated um i feel like that's just it's sort of too heavy-handed for what i want to portray to have lots of saturated colors. I mean, it's beautiful and I love saturated colors. And, you know, I could look at Van Gogh all day long, uh, <laughs> but it's not what I want to portray and not what I want to say. The, my figures are emotional communication devices and they're about interpreting feelings that aren't clear or direct. And so I want ambiguity and that that translates to the color pa- palette as well is that they're they're muted. They're not trying to be overly dark or light or saturated or happy or mean or angry. They're supposed to be in between spaces. And so the color palette, I keep that way. I feel like you have a very distinct palette and that it's easy to recognize your work. It, it feels branded in a way that is very like cohesive. It's very thoughtful. And I feel like I can recognize one of your paintings a mile away just from the the like kinds of grays you use <laughs> and the cool tones you That's use <laughs> and it's, it's very nice it's it's very thoughtful I had a teacher once who was like Stephanie y- your relationships to your colors matter so much that if you put even a speck of that cadmium yellow against that gray tones that you've got it'll change the entire painting just like a speck of it and you have to be so careful about how you're using such intense contrast like that and it's very powerful but it's also easy to make mistakes with and I feel it like is. When you go back to your early landscapes, you can see how you are just refining that and refining that and refining that over the years. And they're, yes. Oh, they're so good. <laughs> yeah, I definitely doing it over and over again. You start to learn the little bits of, oh, that works when I use about this much or that much and mm-hmm. make it about that size, that size. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> using a lot of colors is just hard. I can't remember half the colors I'm using in these things. So it's like the fewer the colors, then I don't have to remember what, what Wait, the color yeah. was. <laughs> way easier way easier i have a whole bag of colors uh just like stored away because i'm like i i can't look at all of these (laughs) (laughs) you're overwhelmed with choice and Mm -hmm. they're like what what blue was that i have 17 blues i don't remember (laughs) (laughs) you have i i see i think you're in your studio right now is that correct yes i can see your paintings in the background can you tell me about your your studio space that you've got oh yeah yeah um I have a studio space in a art complex called Equinox Studios in Seattle, south of Seattle, um, downtown. It, at this point, it's an entire block of old factory industrial buildings that have been converted into um, art studios and shop spaces and um, you know, metalworking studios, woodworking shops, metal shops, fabricators, ironwork guy across the street, the Iron Monkeys. Um, Tabasco runs it. He's awesome. And they do you know big sculpture work, big railing type designs. Um, and then there's Cycle Fab is next door, and they're just an actual CNC shop. Oh, uh, nice. That they do their work. Um, but there's a lot of gauge. The school here is here. They have their atelier here and a bunch of art studios here, painters, um, some book binder over there, which is great. 
Um, and my space is like my dream studio. I'm so happy I got this. Yeah. It's, it's, Can you describe it? Yeah, it's um, tall, big, tall ceilings because it's a factory building and I have the whole ground of the ceiling <laughs> in my space so it goes up you know 30 feet there's a little loft above me that I can put old paintings on or paintings that are waiting to be painted over up there <laughs> I've got my artwork hanging in the walls um mainly because every month the place opens up for the monthly art walk the na- in the neighborhood art walk that's nice and people can come in and see the paintings and talk to me and um so I set it up sort of gallery-esque to be able to show my work um, and hopefully sell it <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but as a working studio, it's fantastic because it's, you know, concrete floors and I can make a mess. I'm not the loudest person in the building by far. Um, so I can play music and just, you know, to, I can step back. It's got kind of a wide space and look at the painting from, you'll get some perspective. In my old studio before this was a little bit small, so it was hard to get, you know, I work on paintings that are about three foot by four foot or five foot by four foot, five foot by three foot, that kind of size. Um, and if I'm too close, you don't get that scale of like, well, look further back and be able to see more of the painting, mm-hmm. uh, but I can do that here, which is great. Um, but I, I love this studio space. It's, it's an amazing community of artists, it's a beautiful space. There's industrial stuff going on. So that's my aesthetic anyways. I bet it really feeds your creativity to be around so many other kinds of creatives just constantly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just like, it's vibrancy in that life. It's like, you know, the difference between living in a rural place and living in like New York City. There's just this energy. Do you think you would happening. paint less if you were not in a space like this? That's a good question. Um, probably wouldn't make a difference because I've just, art has been my life for as long as I can remember. It, and sure. it's just something I always do. So I doubt that I would paint less. I remember having the debate. I remember talking, I talked to a lot of people who have this debate about, do you want your studio in your house where it's easy to access, but you have these distractions like television and food and people, mm-hmm. or do you have an external studio where you're more focused, but you have to go there and it's further away and will you spend less time there? Um, and I don't, I, I was just kind of forced into the like, Oh, I have to get a studio anyways. I'm out of space in my house. Uh, so I didn't think about it anymore at the time it was debating up to that point. But now that I'm here, I love it here. This place is so amazing. Oh, that's great. That I just enjoy being here. So <laughs> if I had it at home, I'd probably paint as much. But I love it being here. And so I make the time to come here and work. What is your typical schedule like? Um, like how many days a week are you going into the studio? And then in a specific day, what's your schedule like? Um, well, I'm a father. So I have uh, my kiddo mm-hmm. um, half time and he's lovely and I love spending time with him. Um, and we do come to the studio occasionally, but it's not super exciting for him to watch me paint for <laughs> hours. So <laughs> um, on days that I have him, I'll come down here sometimes during the day and work for two or three hours um, and then, you know, go home and, and hang out with him. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'm sketching at home or, you know, little, little sketch paintings and things like that at home. Um, on days that I don't have him, I'm, here usually about early afternoon and go until whenever at night I don't know, it could be it could be 6 p.m it could be 4 p.m typically it's like 8 or 9 p.m but I'll, I'll stay here for you know if i'm really into it i'll be here till midnight 1 a.m working on some on stuff if i'm in the groove can you can you walk me like like almost hour by hour of what happens on like an ideal studio day. You come in, it's early afternoon. What what happens? Yeah, uh, so I'll get here. I'm usually really excited to come. So I'm I'm excited to work on something. Um, rarely am I like, oh, I got to solve some broken problem or tackle some painting that I'm struggling <laughs> with. And those are difficult. So I'll get in. I'm usually working on something. So if there's a painting that I'm particularly that I'm working on, I'll jump right into it. So mm-hmm. open up the open up the stuff, you know, get the brushes out. The painting's usually on the st- on the easel already, and I'll go into it. You know, the, you know, I, I do spend like fifteen minutes just looking, trying to remember where I was. What does this really need? Actually, it's a good, probably a good thing that I recognize about myself to mention is when I'm working on a piece and I go home and I think about it 
the the image in my head of the piece is never as good as the actual piece really and so that night i'll be thinking about oh i gotta fix that oh i don't think that nose is working oh that you know that's just not working it'll be based off of what i remember the piece as and i won't you know i'll look at a photo on the phone or something to try and remember but even that is isn't quite right and i'll get back into the studio and i'll, I'll see the painting and be like oh that's not as bad as i remember it. um usually very critical it's gonna take like 15 minutes yeah it's 15 minutes to be like reacquaint myself with the, what the painting actually looks like and not the what i have in my head of what i think the painting looks like uh and then I'll, you know i'll work on it and i usually have multiple pieces going at once uh because i'll get to a point where a painting needs something or is at a point where i'm not sure what to do next and if i keep painting i love painting and i will just keep painting because it's fun, not mm-hmm. because the paint needs any more paint on it. Uh, and that's when I usually ruin a piece. Oh, <laughs> so, no. Got to the point where it's like, once I don't know what I'm doing and I can just look at it and be like, I'm not sure. I think it's, I don't think it's done, but I don't know what to do. It comes off the easel and I'll put it, you know, aside. And usually, so I don't look at it. I'll just give it some time to, you know, reset. I call that the fussing point. Yeah, exactly. It's a great <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> uh, so I'll, yeah, then I'll work on another piece that I'm like, okay, I've got a new one, that you're a, another half-started one. I can go back into that piece, see if something comes up there. Um, and barring that, if I'm just stuck on like two or three pieces, then it's time to start a new one. Hmm. Uh, I'll grab a new panel. And if I'm really stuck, it's time to go paint over an old one or build a new panel. Um, so it's just kind of the boring stuff of like, oh, I'm not sure what to do next. I guess I'll get the gesso out and cover up sander and build a new panel do you work uh, on three or four paintings at the same time then yeah yeah they're mm-hmm. almost always like in a state of rotation although i think the no, i don't think paintings are ever done the only paintings that are done for me are the ones that have sold and are no longer in my possession or i've painted over them <laughs> <laughs> it's the only two states have done that i know anything else if you're in the studio, it's kind of dangerous to be a painting in my studio because you never know when I'm going to be like, well, it's time to get the sander out and go into that one. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I have this like rack behind me that is just filled with paintings that I'm not allowed to touch anymore because they need to be done because I have to move on. <laughs> it's it's great. It's like out of sight. All right. Those don't exist exactly. anymore. <laughs> the upstairs loft in the art space. Like that's where the paintings go when I don't want to paint over them, but I don't want to look at them. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much time I'm like, well, if I'm out of panels and I know that they're up there, I'll probably go paint over them before I go add to my growing collection of paintings by building new panels. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. Do you have any, um, I guess, rituals that you do at the end of your creative day? Like, how do you close down your studio? You know, I don't. Hmm. Uh, make sure I close my my medium jars because they evaporate. <laughs> The one I try and remember to do the most is like, don't forget to... There goes my money, fading into the air. (laughs) Need oil. It's not super expensive, but I'd rather not buy it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's not really particularly like, oh, I've got to, you know, clean up or anything like that. I'm I'm pretty bad about making sure my palette's clean at the end of the day. (laughs) I do that like weekly. I'll go in and take the, the metal scraper and scrape off the palette and start from scratch. And then there's no... There's no real bad. It's not like one of those things like I would recommend that. It's a bad habit. (laughs) (laughs) But there are times, this is a painting I just did last night where I was like, I think this is probably at the point where I need to stop working on it. Mm -hmm. And then I took it and like hit it so that it was like, okay, I'm going to come in, start fresh and not look at it. (laughs) Yeah. Two things I practice the most. But I generally feel like I'm going to be in the studio tomorrow. So... I'm not spending a whole lot of time cleaning up because I'm just going to get right back into it. Do you try to come every day if you can? If I can. Um, Been here probably four or five days out of the seven days of the week. I had a teacher once. I was like, hey, how do I clean my brushes? And he just told me, he's like, you know, if you just come to the studio and you paint every day, you never have to clean your brushes. And I'm like, that's that's so intense. (laughs) closed now but this art store that i used to go to all the time i came in and people working there was like oh you know getting new brushes i'm like yeah you know i i use these kind of brushes but they just get destroyed every like three months and i'm ended up back here buying the same brush over again he's like oh well you know 
you paint a lot, right? Like, you're, he's like, yeah, I'm pretty much in here every day. He's like, yeah, that's about how long brushes last when you use them every day. I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh it's the truth. <laughs> I have a uh, a pot of, it's like an old gardening pot. And it's just like the brush graveyard because I can't f- get myself to throw them away. So I just like stick them in and it's like this like mangled vase of brushes. It's great. I have the exact same same vase. Mm-hmm. just full of brushes that I could just throw out. They're not... <laughs> <laughs> the landfill is my studio yep um <laughs> here we are gosh okay changing changing tracks just a little bit sometimes i ask this of artists because i think it's interesting first off do you feel successful in your art mm. yeah that's a great question i sometimes do mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess, answer. um but it's something that i struggled with for a long time and probably struggled with more when I started painting and probably struggle with more, the better I got. Mm. Uh, What were some of your doubts that ate at that? Well, those I can, those I can iterate because I know them intimately. Yeah. It was not going to be self self critical, but (laughs) you know, the, the anatomy is always there uh, and a challenge. And so getting things accurate, getting things right, getting something to look right is always a struggle and always a challenge. Um, And I feel like, you know, oh, I should study more so I'd be more effective at it. Mm-hmm. But I I think it's because I'm getting, the better you get, the better your eye gets and the more critical you become. And so it's a it's chasing the dragon. You're always going to see it and see it in accuracies and then feel you're inadequate no matter how good you get. That's, the um, truth. that's just something that therapy helps <laughs> to mm-hmm. kind of, with your own self doubts and understand them and see them in a way that that's the positive light. I'm I'm self critical because I'm getting better and I'm recognizing more about what I want to do. Um, so I try and remember that that's why I'm being why I don't like something. It's, the, it's, it's a sign of growth. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the the biggest one, the biggest lesson I felt I learned in that kind of. Um, self-critical or, or successful sort of sense was, you know, my partner said, when people ask you what you do, you always answer with like, whatever your day job is, you know, I'm a, oh, I'm a software and, you know, I work for this company, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. They were like, why don't you tell people you're an artist? Cause that's what your real passion is. And you do it like a full-time job. So just say you're an artist. And I was like, huh. And so I started doing that and it had an immense impact and how well of an artist I was it really just changed me fundamentally from like oh I'm just kind of doing this on the side or not really pushing myself on this to something that I took seriously and took myself seriously and said no I should be proud of this and that made a huge difference so like my biggest recommendation to people who ask like you know tips for becoming an artist or being an artist I'm like take yourself seriously no matter how often you do it or how little you do it or whether you do it on the side or you do it you know, whatever it is, just treat yourself professionally. Treat yourself like you're an artist and be an artist. It doesn't there's no there's no committee that's gonna stamp that, you know, that title oh, on. I don't know. I don't think you're an artist. That doesn't exist. <laughs> I I love that advice. Saying I am an artist is one, just a powerful affirmation of your your own creative work, but two, it's it's hard to do at first. And like the first time you say I am an artist out loud to someone who's like a stranger, it's like, feels weird. It feels like (laughs) alarming. (laughs) Um, But the more you do it, the it definitely changes how you think about your work in such a wonderful way. It's that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. And so now, you know, when I sell a piece that certainly feels successful, and it took a long time to sell pieces. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I was oil painting, I would just hold on to them because I, I really liked them. And then if I would like them for a certain amount of time. And then I wouldn't like them. I wouldn't want to sell them because I didn't like them. And now I've gotten over that whole, like, uh, I don't want to sell my pieces too. I love selling pieces because the feeling I get when, it, you know, selling a piece is great because it means I'm maintaining financial stability we love as an it. artist. Right? <laughs> That's really just mechanism it doesn't make me feel good it just makes me feel stable Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like when people come in here every month and they look at my paintings and i they talk about what they get from them understanding that when people make an emotional connection to the paintings 
and they talk about how they feel and what it makes them feel and what they love about it. And some, it usually comes with some personal thing that they're going through or they're you know, an emotion they're feeling. That's for me, the, the success part, you know, and when, obviously when they buy it, they feel those things and that makes me feel even better. Um, but it's that emotional connection I can make with people uh, that really, for me, is why I spend so much time doing this. Like, I feel the connection with these pieces, and then somebody else can come and feel another connection and make their own emotional connections to the piece. That's so satisfying and so, you know, meaningful to me. I think it's, like, vitally important in today's culture to recognize that emotional sensitivity and the vulnerability and people's connections, emotional connections with each other. And not everything is just awfulness. And just, yeah, it's like, it's the way to find connections to people and, and find that humanity. I love that you sell your work and I like that you like selling your work. I, I know a lot of artists, especially younger artists who are like, oh, I don't want to sell them because either A, they're my precious babies or B, um, I am i don't want people to look at my artwork or whatever. But, you know, then they're like, oh, I also need money. And you're like, you do need money. And I feel like there comes a point in your life where you might love your precious paintings, but then at some point you're like, mm, it'd be nice to pay rent this month <laughs> and your desire to have that financial income. Um, and the ability to find a buyer goes hand in hand. It becomes a very nice thing. Do you ever regret selling any of your any of your paintings? Uh, not nice. anymore. You know, one of the things that I also realized and kind of goes back into the self criticism doubt thing is that the the paintings almost inevitably have a shelf life of how long they can sit in my studio and I can see them before I don't like them. I'll find some flaw inevitably, like. It goes along with that, you know, I'm, I'm getting better and my eye gets more critical. The better I get, the older paintings, I start to see what's wrong with them. It wasn't as obvious as it was back when I was painting them. And so there's like a six month period where I'll love a painting and then it's, I'm not going to love it. Mm -hmm. And I just realized it was a pain to, it was a pain and frustrating and sort of taxing just to have that emotional baggage of paintings that I no longer liked that I wanted to get rid of. I didn't want to sell them because I thought they were crap. <laughs> and then there's just this cycle of like, make a painting, not want to sell it because I liked it. Then I wouldn't like it. And I wouldn't want to sell it because I didn't like it. But then it would just annoy me. <sighs> uh, got of that cycle, I was like, why don't I just sell the piece when I'm happy with it? So then I'm just going to stay happy with it. I don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I think Black said this too at some point was the idea of every piece you do is getting better and you have to lose that sense of preciousness when you're working on a painting mm -hmm. a lot of that like if you you paint a figure and the hand is exquisite it's perfect and hands are hard so you're like I love that hand but the face doesn't work and you will spend eons like years trying to make the face work when the problem is the hand is just in the wrong spot and it's the most perfect hand but it can't be where it is and the only way out of that is to erase the perfect hand and Help. start in the right place. And so that sort of lesson of you, you can't hold on to this preciousness and make a successful painting at the same time uh, sort of translated to me is like, I may find this painting precious, but I can paint it again. Mm -hmm. Like, because once I should be able to paint it again. I know all the techniques. I know all the things that I did to make it. I know what I liked about it. I've studied it. It's almost like I could do it again, probably better because now that I've done it once, I know some of the mistakes that I made. Uh, and so that helps selling pieces as well. It's like sell them when you're happy with them, leave them wanting more. I love that painting and now I don't have to hate it in the future. <laughs> it's wonderful. You have to break what seems perfect. You have to, if something's wrong with the painting, you gotta, you gotta take what seems perfect and mess it up. <laughs> So. especially when you know that it's perfect and it's in the wrong spot once you know you have to just say uh i gotta do it again fine <laughs> painting is such a wild adventure in your ego and i love it and <laughs> it's so, it's so good for us what is one piece of advice you would suggest for an artist who is trying to become a professional and eventually sell their artwork yeah i think the first one is the one i mentioned before which is just call yourself an artist mm -hmm. don't 
don't hide that fact. Don't feel shame about it. Don't feel shame that you're doing it as a hobby or you're not selling it or whatever hang up there is. Like treat yourself like an artist so that you have respect for yourself and your work that you're doing. And it's important to do the work every time you're drawing and sketching and thinking mm -hmm. about important work um, that that's what being a professional is. It's not, you're not working to become a professional where all you do is produce masterpieces day in, day out. It's just a constant stream of work, sketching and studying and reading and looking at books and doing the tutorials, the sketchbooks full of stupid hand exercises still. I will always have sketchbooks of stupid hand exercises. And they're perfect. <laughs> they're all just... <laughs> It takes a lot of work to get things exactly right. So, I've, you know, that's a big one, treating yourself professionally. Probably the other one is just draw every day. That mm -hmm. was many people have told me. And I, if you're just constantly drawing, it can be 90% crap. You're getting better the more you do it. So just keep keep drawing, keep that sketchbook, carry it around with you. It's just any opportunity. And don't, you know, don't feel bad. People love, I, I'll go to the bar down here and hang out with friends. And like, I bring my sketchbook. They've just come to know me as the bartenders know me as the guy who has a <laughs> sketchbook. I actually make other people draw just to kind of get people, you know, in the habit of it. Um, so it's just a constant, like, keep the, keep the sketchbook going, draw all the time, think about art. That's how you get better. And somebody else was asking me one of the things like, you know, how do you approach galleries or how do you um, get these shows or how did you meet some gallery director? Mm -hmm. If you just do this stuff long enough and you're open, you have an open, partake in open studios or open gallery nights, you go out to other galleries and you talk to people and look at the art, you start to, you start to learn the community. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, same people are going to be there and you're going to start to know them. And the more you go, the more they're going to recognize you. And you're just going to build up a community that way of people, you know, and you then, show up. When, yeah, you got to show up and talk to those people and they'll show up. Like if you, if you can get a space where you're part of a monthly art walk kind of thing, then yeah, you get to meet these people coming in and they see your stuff and you just end up building a, a community that way. And it's almost organic. You don't have to go seek out these, you know, a gallery that's going to represent you cold you can go in there and talk to them and just be part of this community and you know apply and keep applying and um, get the rejection and keep applying <laughs> <laughs> so that's a way to, to being part of the artist community by showing up to gallery nights and things is a good way to meet people that is some excellent advice yes show up uh, call yourself an artist and draw all the time. And this goes for you artists who are not just painters or like uh, people who draw. Like if you're a collage artist, if you are a digital artist, if you are any kind of artist, drawing all the time will help you. <laughs> it's like the universal medicine for artists. Have a sketchbook. Draw things. Yeah. And I write in my sketchbooks and I sketch little machinery in my, like it's the way to exercise thinking just as mm -hmm. much as it's size to practice drawing so it, it applies to pretty much anything do you have any projects coming up in the future any shows any new things you're working on yeah the industrial landscapes most of them are up at catalyst fine art uh which is at the lodge in saint edwards in kenmore yeah so a bunch of them are there which is nice uh it's a cool space it's an old hotel built on a uh what was a seminary school for and now it's a hotel, kind of fancy, a couple bars, looks like a nice place. Cool. And a bunch of my art's there. Um, and then I've got a show coming up in March. Uh, I don't remember where that one's at. <laughs> I know physically where it's at. <laughs> I will uh, have the links to all these shows and everything we talked about in the show notes, friends. Um, so you can find the show at Catalyst for Dave. And <laughs> yeah. Brand new. So I'm like, oh, right. We just talked about the show. So I don't think we've set up any marketing materials. Um, yeah, I usually do some uh, shows at Gallery Arado around the holidays. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing that again this year. But uh, they, they often have my stuff. They've got a bunch of my old sketchbook paintings and drawings. Uh, so that's over there at Gallery Arado in Pioneer Square. Rad. There is one more show. Uh, December 9th is the big Equinox. Um, 
open house party where they close off the street and there's food and music and booze and just a big party a bunch of the artists are open a bunch of the gauge is open so uh that's the big party for that we have yearly at this place um and it's it's a blast and i'll be here all day and uh there'll be a bunch of artists and vendors and things so december 9th will be a big show heck yeah be there be square <laughs> dave where can people find you on the internet i'm at daveclay.com and instagram i am daveclay underscore art y'all should give him a follow it would be great dave thank you so much for being on freshwork podcast it was nice to chat with you today thank you very much <laughs>